Part One of Child Christopher and Goldil in the Fair by William Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One of the King of Oakenrealm and his wife and his child. Of old there was a land which was so much a woodland that a minstrel thereof said it that a squirrel might go from end to end and all about from tree to tree and never touch the earth therefore was that land called oakenrealm the lord and king thereof was a stark man and so great a warrior that in his youth he took no delight in aught else save battle and tourneys but when he was hard on forty years old he came across a daughter of a certain lord whom he had vanquished and his eyes berayed him into longing so that he gave back to the said lord the havings he had conquered of him that he might lay the maiden in his kingly bed so he brought her home with him to oakenrealm and wedded her tells the tale that he rued not his bargain but loved her so dearly that for a year round he wore no armour save when she bade him play in the tilt-yard for her desport and pride so wore the days till she went with child and was near her time and then it betid that three kings who marched on oakenrealm banded them together against him and his lords and thanes cried out on him to lead them to battle and it behoved him to do as they would so he sent out the tokens and bade an hosting at his chief city and when all was ready he said farewell to his wife and her babe unborn and went his ways to battle once more but fierce was his heart against the foemen that they had dragged him away from his love and his joy even amidst of his land he joined battle with the host of the ravagers and the tale of them is short to tell for they were as the wheat before the hook but as he followed up the chase a mere thrall of the fleers turned on him and cast his spear and it reached him whereas his hauberk was broken and stood deep in so that he fell to earth on mighty and when his lords and chieftains drew about him and cunning men strove to heal him it was of no avail and he knew that his soul was departing then he sent for a priest and for the marshal of the host who was a great lord and the son of his father's brother and in few words bade him look to the babe whom his wife bore about and if it were a man to cherish him and do him to learn all that a king ought to know and if it were a maiden that he should look to her wedding well and worthily and he let swear him on his sword on the edges and the hilts that he would do even so and be true unto his child if child there were and he bade him have rule if so be the lords would and all the people till the child were of age to be king and the marshal swore and all the lords who stood around bear witness to his swearing thereafter the priest household the king and he received his creator and a little while after his soul departed but the marshal followed up the fleeing foe and two battles more he fought before he beat them flat to earth and then they craved for peace and he went back to the city in mickle honour but in the king's city of oakenham he found but little joy for both the king was bemoaned whereas he had been no hard man to his folk and also when the tidings and the king's corpse came back to oakenrealm his lady and queen took sick for sorrow and fear and fell into labour of her child and in childing of a man bairn she died but the lad lived and was like to do well so there was one funeral for the slain king and for her whom his slaying had slain and when that was done the little king was born to the font and at his christening he gat to name christopher thereafter the marshal summoned all them that were due thereto to come and give homage to the new king and even so did they though he were but a babe yea and who had but just now been a king lying in his mother's womb but when the homage was done then the marshal called together the wise men and told them how the king that was had given him in charge his son as then unborn and the ruling of the realm till the said son were come to man's estate but he bade them seek one worthier if they had heart to gainsay the word of their dying lord then all they said that he was worthy and mighty 
and the choice of their dear lord, and that they would have none but he. So then was the great folk moat called, and the same matter was laid before all the people, and none said aught against it, whereas no man was ready to name another to that charge and rule, even had it been his own self. Now then, by law was the marshal, who hight Rolf, lord and earl of the land of Oakenrealm. He ruled well and strongly, and was a fell warrior. He was well befriended by many of the great, and the rest of them feared him and his friends. As for the commonalty, they saw that he held the realm in peace, and as for the rest, they knew little, and saw less of him, and they paid to his bailiffs and sheriffs as little as they could, and more than they would. But whereas that left them somewhat to grind their teeth on, and they were not harried, they were not so ill content, so the marshal throve, and lacked nothing of a king's place, save the bare name. CHAPTER Two, OF THE KING'S SON As for the king's son, to whom the folk had of late done homage as king, he was at first seen about a corner of the high house with his nurses, and then in a while it was said, and the tale noted, but not much, that he must needs go for his health's sake, and because he was puny, to some stead amongst the fields, and folk heard say that he was gone to the strong house of a knight, somewhat stricken in years, who was called Lord Richard the Lean. The said house was some twelve miles from Oakenham, not far from the northern edge of the Wildwood. But in a while, scarce more than a year, Lord Richard brake up the house at the said castle, and went southward through the forest. Of this departure was little said, for he was not a man amongst the foremost. As for the king's little son, if any remembered that he was in the hands of the said Lord Richard, none said aught about it, for if any thought of the little babe at all, they said to themselves, Never will he come to be king. Now as for Lord Richard the lean, he went far through the wood, and until he was come to another house of his, that stood in a clearing somewhat near to where Oakenrealm marched on another country, which hight Medum, though the said Wildwood ended not where Oakenrealm ended, but stretched a good way into Medum, and betwixt one and the other, much rough country there was. It is to be said that amongst those who went to this stronghold of the woods was the little King Christopher, no longer puny, but a stout babe enough. So he was born amongst the serving men and thralls to the castle of the outer march, and he was in no wise treated as a great man's son. But there was more than one woman who was kind to him, and as he waxed in strength and beauty month by month, both Carl and Queen fell to noting him, and, for as little as he was, he began to be well beloved. As to the stead where he was nourished, though it were far away amongst the woods, it was no such lonely or savage place. Besides the castle and the houses of it, there was a merry thorpe in the clearing, the houses whereof were set down by the side of a clear and pleasant little stream. Moreover, the good men and swains of the said township were no ill folk, but bold of heart, free of speech, and goodly of favour, and the women of them fair, kind, and trusty. Whiles came folk journeying in to Oakenrealm or out to Medum, and of these some were minstrels, who had with them tidings of what was astir, whereas folk were thicker in the world, and some chapmen, who chaffered with the thorpe-dwellers, and took of them the woodland spoil for such outland goods as those woodmen needed. So wore the years, and in Oakenham King Christopher was well-nigh forgotten, and in the Wildwood had never been known clearly for King's son. At first, by command of Rolf the Marshal, a messenger came every year from Lord Richard with a letter that told of how the lad Christopher did, but when five years were worn, the marshal bade send him tidings thereof every three years, and by then it was come to the twelfth year, and still the tidings were that the lad throve ever, and meanwhile the marshal sat fast in his seat with none to gainsay. The word went to Lord Richard that he should send no more, for that he, the marshal, had heard enough of the boy, and if he throve it were well, and if not it was no worse. So wore the days and the years. Chapter 3. Of the King of Medum and his Daughter. 
tells the tale that in the country which lay south of Oakenrealm and was called Medum, there was in these days a king whose wife was dead, but had left him a fair daughter, who was born some four years after King Christopher. A good man was this King Roland, mild, bounteous, and no regarder of persons in his justice, and well beloved he was of his folk. Yet could not their love keep him alive, for when as his daughter was of the age of twelve years, he sickened unto death, and so, when he knew that his end drew near, he sent for the wisest of his wise men, and they came unto him sorrowing in the high house of his chiefest city, which hight Mead Hampstead. So he bade them sit down nigh unto his bed, and took up the word and spake. Masters, my good lords, ye may see clearly that a sundering is at hand, and that I must needs make a long journey, whence I shall come back never. Now I would, and I am verily of duty bound thereto, that I leave behind me some good order in the land. Furthermore, I would that my daughter, when she is of age thereto, should be queen in Medum, and rule the land. Neither will it be many years before she shall be of ripe age for ruling, if ever she may be, and I deem not that there shall be any lack in her, whereas her mother could all courtesy, and was as wise as a woman may be. But how say ye, my masters? So they all with one consent said yea, and they would ask for no better king than their lady his daughter. Then said the king, Hearken carefully, for my time is short. Yet is she young and a maiden, though she be wise. Now therefore do I need some man well looked to of the folk, who shall rule the land in her name, till she be of eighteen winters, and who shall be her good friend and counsellor into all wisdom thereafter. Which of you, my masters, is meet for this matter? Then they all looked one on the other, and spake not, and the king said, Speak, some one of you, without fear. This is no time for tarrying. Thereon spake an elder, the oldest of them, and said, Lord, this is the very truth, that none of us here present are meet for this office, whereas, among other matters, we be all unmeet for battle. Some of us have never been warriors, and other some are past the age for leading an host. To say the sooth, king, there is but one man in Medham who may do what thou wilt, and not fail, both for his wisdom and his might of field, and the account which is had of him amongst the people. And that man is Earl Geoffrey of the Southern Marches. Ye say sooth, quoth the king, but is he down in the south, or nigh at a hand? Said the elder, he is as now in Medhamstead, and may be in this chamber in scant half an hour. So the king bade send for him, and there was silence in the chamber till he came in, clad in a scarlet kirtle and a white coat, and with his sword by his side. He was a tall man, bigly made, somewhat pale of face, black and curly of hair, blue-eyed, thin-lipped, and hook-nosed as an eagle. A man, warrior-like, and somewhat fierce of aspect, he knelt down by the king's bedside, and asked him, in a sorrowful voice, what he would. And the king said, I ask a great matter of thee, and all these my wise men, and I myself with all, deem that thou canst do it, and thou alone. Nay, hearken, I am departing, and I would have thee hold my place, and do unto my people even what I would do, if I myself were living, and to my daughter, as nigh to that as may be. I say all this thou mayst do, if thou wilt be as trusty and leal to me after I am dead, as thou hast seemed to all men's eyes to have been while I was living. What sayest thou? The earl had hidden his face in the coverlet of the bed while the king was speaking, but now he lifted up his face, weeping, and said, Kinsman and friend and king, this is naught hard to do, but if it were, yet would I do it. It is well, said the king. My heart fails me and my voice so, so give heed, and set thine ear close to my mouth. Hearken, belike my daughter Goldilind shall be one of the fairest of women. I bid thee wed her to the fairest of men, and the strongest, 
and to none other. Thereat his voice failed him indeed, and he lay still, but he died not, till presently the priest came to him, and as he might, houseled him. Then he departed. As for Earl Geoffrey, when the king was buried, and the homages done to the maiden Goldilind, he did no worse than those wise men deemed of him, but bestirred him, and looked full sagely into all the matters of the kingdom, and did so well therein, that all men praised his rule perforce, whether they loved him or not, and sooth to say, he was not much beloved. CHAPTER Four OF THE MAIDEN GOLDILIND Amidst of all his other business, Earl Geoffrey bethought him in a while of the dead king's daughter, and he gave her in charge to a gentlewoman, somewhat stricken in years, a widow of high lineage, but not over-wealthy. She dwelt in her own house in a fair valley, some twenty miles from Meadhamstead. There abode Goldilind, till a year and a half was worn, and had due observance, but little love, and not much kindness from the said gentlewoman, who hight Dame Eleanor Leeshow. Howbeit, time and again came knights and ladies and lords to see the little lady, and kissed her hand, and did obeisance to her. Yet more came to her in the first three months of her sojourn at Leeshow, than the second, and more in the second than the third. At last, on a day when the said year and a half was fully worn, thither came Earl Geoffrey with a company of knights and men-at-arms, and he did obeisance, as due was, to his master's daughter, and then spake a while privily with Dame Eleanor, and thereafter they went into the hall, he and she and Goldilind, and there before all men he spake aloud and said, My lady Goldilind, me seemeth ye dwell here all too straightly, for neither is this house of Leeshow great enough for thy state, and the entertainment of the knights and lords who shall have will to seek thee hither, nor is the wealth of thy liege dame and governant as great as it should be, and thou, meseemeth, wouldst have it. Wherefore I have been considering thy desires herein, and if thou deem it meet to give a gift to Dame Eleanor, and live queenlier thyself than now thou dost, then mayst thou give unto her the castle of Green Harbour, and the six manors appertaining thereto, and with all the rights of wildwood and fen and fell that lie thereabouts. Also, if thou wilt, thou mayst honour the said castle with abiding there a while at thy pleasure, and I shall see to it that thou have due many to go with thee thither. How sayest thou, my lady? Amongst that company there were two or three who looked at each other and half smiled, and two or three looked on the maiden, who was goodly as of her years, as if with compassion, but the more part kept countenance in full courtly wise. Then spake Goldilind in a quavering voice, for she was afraid and wise, and she said, Cousin and Earl, we will that all this be done, and it likes me well to eke the wealth of this lady and my good friend Dame Eleanor. Quoth Earl Geoffrey, Kneel before thy lady, Dame, and put thine hands between hers, and thank her for the gift. So Dame Eleanor knelt down, and did homage and obeisance for her new land, and Goldilind raised her up and kissed her, and bade her sit down beside her, and spake to her kindly, and all men praised the maiden for her gentle and courteous ways, and Dame Eleanor smiled upon her and them what she could. She was small of body and sleek, but her cheeks somewhat flagging, brown eyes she had, long half-opened, thin lips and chin somewhat falling away from her mouth. Hard on fifty winters had she seen, yet there have been those who were older and goodlier both. CHAPTER V. GOLDILIND COMES TO GREEN HARBOUR But a little while tarried the Earl of Geoffrey at Leeshow, but departed next morning and came to Meadhamstead. A month thereafter came folk from him to Leeshow, to wit, the new many for the new abode of Goldilind, amongst whom was a goodly band of men-at-arms, led by an old lord pinched and peevish of face, who kneeled to Goldilind as the new burgreave of Green Harbour, and a chaplain, a black cannon, young, broad-cheeked and fresh-looking, but hard-faced and unlovely. Three new damsels withal were come for the new queen, not young maids, but stalworth women, well-grown, 
and two of them hard-featured, the third tall, black-haired, and a goodly-fashioned body. Now when these were come, who were all under the rule of Dame Eleanor, there was no gainsaying the departure to the new home, and in two days' time they went their ways from Leeshow. But though Goldilind was young, she was wise, and her heart misgave her, when she was amidst this new many, that she was not riding toward glory and honour, and a world of worship and friends beloved. Howbeit, what so might lie before her, she put a good face upon it, and did to those about her queenly, and with all courtesy. Five days they rode from Leeshow north away, by Thorpe and town and mead and river, till the land became little peopled, and the sixth day they rode in the wild wood ways, where there was no folk, save now and again the little cot of some forester or collier. But the seventh day, about noon, they came into a clearing of the wood, a rugged little plain of Leeland, mingled with Marish, with a little deal of acre-land in barley and rye, round about a score of poor-frame houses, set down scatter-meal about the lee. But on a long ridge at the northern end of the said plain was a grey castle, strong and with big and high towers, yet not so much greater than was Leeshow, deemed Goldilind, as for a dwelling-house. Howbeit they entered the said castle, and within as without it was somewhat grim, though naught was lacking of plenishing due for folk nightly. Long it were to tell of its walls and baileys and chambers, but let this suffice, that on the north side, toward the thick forest, was a garden of greensward and flowers and pot-herbs, and a garth-wall of grey stone, not very high, was the only defence thereof toward the wood. But it was overlooked by a tall tower of the great wall, which hides the forester's tower. In the said outer garth wall also was a postern, whereby there was not seldom coming in and going out. Now when Goldilind had been in her chamber for a few days, she found out for certain what she had before misdoubted, that she had been brought from Leeshow and the peopled parts near to Meadhamstead into the uttermost parts of the realm to be kept in prison there. Howbeit, it was in a way prison courteous. She was still served with observance, and bowed before, and called my lady and queen, and so forth. Also she might go from chamber to hall, and chapel, to and fro, yet scarce alone, and into the garden she might go, yet not for the more part unaccompanied, and even at whiles she went out a gates, but then ever with folk on the right hand and the left. Forsooth, whiles and again, within the next two years of her abode at Green Harbour, out of gate she went and alone, but that was as the prisoner who strives to be free, although she had, forsooth, no thought or hope of escape, and as the prisoner brought back, was she chastised when she came within gates again. Everywhere, to be short, within and about the castle of Green Harbour, did Goldilind meet the will and the tyranny of the little sleek widow, Dame Eleanor, to whom both Carl and Queen, in that corner of the world, were but as servants and slaves to do her will. And the said Eleanor, who at first was but spiteful in word and look towards her lady, waxed worse as time wore, and as the blossom of the king's daughter's womanhood began to unfold, till at last the she-jailer had scarce feasted any day when she had not in some wise grieved and tormented her prisoner, and whatever she did, none had might to say her nay. But Goldilin took all with a high heart, and her courage grew with her years. Nor would she bow the head before any grief, but took to her whatsoever solace might come to her, as the pleasure of the sun and the wind, and the beholding of the greenery of the wood, and the fowl and the beasts playing, which oft she saw afar, and whiles anear, though whiles forsooth she saw naught of it all, whereas she was shut up betwixt four walls, and that not of her chamber, but of some bare and foul prison of the castle, which, with other griefs, must she needs thole under the name and guise of penance. However, she waxed so exceeding fair and sweet and lovely, that the loveliness of her pierced to the hearts of many of her jailers, so that some of them, and specially of the squires and men-at-arms, would do her some easement which they might do unrebuked, 
or not sorely rebuked as bringing her flowers in the spring or whiles a singing bird or a squirrel and an old man there was of the men-at-arms who would ask leave and get it at whiles and come to her in her chamber or the garden and tell her minstrel tales and the like for her joyance sooth to say even the pinched heart of old burgreave was somewhat touched by her and he alone had any might to stand between her and dame eleanor so that but for him it had gone much harder with her than it did for the rest none entered the castle from the world without nay not so much as a travelling monk or a friar on his wanderings save and except some messenger of earl geoffrey who had errand with dame eleanor or the burgreave so wore the days and the seasons till it was now more than four years since she had left leeshow and her eighteenth summer was beginning but now the tale leaves telling of goldilind and goes back to the matters of oakenrealm and therein to what has to do with king christopher and rolf the marshal End of part one. Part two of Child Christopher and Goldilind the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six How Rolf the Marshal Dreams a Dream and Comes to the Castle of the Uttermost March. Now, this same summer, when King Christopher was of twenty years and two, Rolf the marshal, sleeping one noontide in the king's garden at Oakenham, dreamed a dream, for him seemed that there came through the garth gate a woman fair and tall, and clad in naught but oaken leaves, who led by the hand an exceedingly goodly young man of twenty summers, and his visage like to the last battle-dead king of Oakenrealm when he was a young man. And the said woman led the swain up to the marshal, who asked in his mind what these two were and the woman answered his thought and said i am the woman of the woods and the land white of oakenrealm and this lovely lad whose hand i hold is my king and thy king and the king of oakenrealm wake fool wake and look to it what thou wilt do and therewith he woke up crying out and drew forth his sword but when he was fully awakened he was ashamed and went into the hall and sat in his high seat and strove to think out of his troubled mind but for all he might do he fell asleep again and again in the hall he dreamed as he had dreamed in the garden and when he awoke from his dream he had no thought in his head but how he might the speediest come to the house of lord richard the lean and look to the matter of his lord's son and see him with his eyes and if it might be take some measure with the threat which lay in the lad's life nought he tarried but set off in an hour's time with no more company than four men-at-arms and an old squire of his who was wont to do his bidding without question whether it were good or evil so they went by frith and fell by wood and fair ways till in two days time they were come by undern within sight of the castle of the outer march and entered into the street of the thorpe aforesaid and they saw that there were no folk therein and at the house doors save old carls and carlines scarce wayworthy and little children who might not go afoot but from the field and nigh the thorpe came the sound of shouting and glad voices and through the lanes of the houses they saw on the field many people in gay raiment going to and fro as though there were games and sports toward thereof lord rolf he did naught but went his ways straight to the castle and was brought with all honour into the hall and thither came lord richard the lean hastening and half afeard and did obeisance to him and there were but a few in the hall and they stood out of earshot of the two lords the marshal spoke graciously to lord richard and made him sit beside him and said in a soft voice we have come to see thee lord and how the folk do in the uttermost marches also we would wot how it goes with a lad whom we sent to thee when he was yet a babe whereat he was some by-blow of the late king our lord and master and we deemed thee both rich enough and kind enough to breed him into thriving without increasing pride upon him and firstly is the lad yet alive he knitted his brow as he spake for carefulness of soul but lord richard smiled upon him though as one somewhat troubled and answered lord marshal i thank thee for visiting this poor house 
and i shall tell thee first that the lad lives and hath thriven marvellously though he be somewhat unruly and will abide no correction now these last six years sooth to say there is now no story of his being anywise akin to our late lord king though true it is that folk in this far away corner of the land call him king christopher but only in a manner of jesting but it is no jest wherein they say they will gainsay him naught and that especially the young women yet i will say of him that he is wise and asketh not over much the more is the sorrow of many of the maidens a fell woodsman he is an exceeding stark and as yet heedeth more of valiance than of the love of woman the marshal looked no less troubled than before at these words he said i would see this young man speedily so shall it be lord said lord richard therewith he called to him a squire and said go thou down into the thorpe and bring hither christopher for that a great lord is here who would set him to do a deed of woodcraft such is more than the want of men so the squire went his ways and was gone a little while and meantime drew nigh to the hall a sound of triumphing songs and shouts and right up to the hall doors then entered the squire and by his side came a tall young man clad but in a white linen shirt and deerskin brogues his head crowned with a garland of flowers him the squire brought up to the lords on the dais and louted to them and said my lords i bring you christopher and he not over willing for now hath he been but just crowned king of the games down yonder but when the carls and queens there said that they would come with him and bear him company to the hall doors then forsooth he yea said the coming it were not a meet that some shame were done him peace man said lord richard what hath this to do with thee seest thou not the lord marshal here the lord rolf sat and gazed on the lad and scowled on him but christopher saw therein naught but the face of a great lord burdened with many cares so when he had made obeisance he stood up fearlessly and merrily before them sooth to say he was full fair to look on for all his strength which as ye shall hear was mighty all the fashion of his limbs and his body was light and clean done and beauteous and though his skin where it showed naked was all tanned with the summer it was fine and sleek and kindly every deal thereof bright-eyed and round-cheeked he was with full lips and carven chin and his hair golden brown of hue and curling crisp about the blossoms of his garland so must we say that he was such an youngling as most might have been in the world had not man's malice been and the mischief of grudging and the marring of grasping but now spake lord rolf sir varlet they tell me that thou art a mighty hunter and of mickle guile in woodcraft wilt thou then hunt somewhat for me and bring me home a catch seldom seen yea lord king said christopher i will at least do my best if thou but tell me where to seek the quarry and when it is well said the marshal and to-morrow my squire whom thou seest yonder and who hight simon shall tell thee where the hunt is up and thou shalt go with him but hearken thou shalt not call me king for to-day there is no king in oakenrealm and i am but marshal and earl of the king that shall be the lad fell amusing for a minute and then he said yea lord marshal i shall do thy will but meseemeth i have heard some tale of one who was but of late king in oakenrealm is it not so lord stint thy talk young man cried the marshal in a harsh voice and abide to-morrow who knoweth who shall be king and whether thou or i shall live to see him but as he spake the words they seemed to his heart like a foretelling of evil and he turned pale and trembled and said to christopher come hither lad i will give thee a gift and then shalt thou depart till to-morrow so christopher drew near to him and the marshal pulled off a ring from his finger and set it on the lad's and said to him now depart in peace and christopher bent the knee to him and thanked him for the gracious gift of the ruler of oakenrealm and then went his ways out of the hall and the folk without gave a glad cry as he came amongst them but by then he was come to the door lord rolf looked on his hand and saw that instead of giving the youngling a finger-ring which he had bought of a merchant for a price of five peasants as he had meant to do he had given him a ring which the old king had had whereon was the first letter of his name christopher to wit and a device of crowned rose for this ring was a signet of his wherefore was the marshal once more sore troubled 
and he arose and he was half minded to run down the hall after christopher but he refrained him and presently smiled to himself and then fell a-talking to lord richard sweetly and pleasantly so wore the day to evening but ere he went to bed the lord rolf had a privy talk first with lord richard and after with his squire simon what followed of that talk ye may hear after chapter seven how christopher went a journey into the wild wood next morning christopher who slept in the little hall of the inner court of the castle arose betimes and came to the great gate but for as early as he was there he saw the squire simon abiding him standing between two strong horses to him he gave the seal of the day and the squire greeted him but in somewhat surly wise then he said to him well king christopher art thou ready for the road yea as thou seest said the youngling smiling for indeed he had breeches now beneath his shirt and a surcoat of green woollen over it boots of deerskin had he withal and spurs thereon he was girt with a short sword and had a quiver of arrows at his back and bare a great bow in his hand yea quoth simon thou deemest thee a gay swain belike but thou lookest likelier for a deer stealer than a rider hung up to thy shooting gear deemest thou we go a hunting of the hind quoth christopher i wot not squire but the great lord who lieth sleeping yonder hath told me that thou shouldest give me his errand and of some hunting or feat of woodcraft he spake moreover this crooked stick can drive a shaft through matters harder than a hind side simon looked confused and he reddened and stammered somewhat as he answered ah yea so it was i mind me i will tell thee anon said christopher with all squire if we are wending into the wood as needs we must unless we ride round about this dale in a ring all day dost thou deem we shall go at a gallop many a mile nay fair sir the horses shall wend a foot's pace oftenest and we shall go afoot not on seldom through the thickets now was simon come to himself again and that self was surly so he said ay ay little king thou deemest thee exceeding wise in these woods dost thou not and forsooth thou mayst be yet have i tidings for thee yea and what be they said christopher simon grinned even these said he that dr knowall was no man's cousin while he lived and that he died last week therewith he swung himself into his saddle and christopher laughed merrily at his poor gibe and mounted in likewise wherewithal they rode their ways through the thorp and at the southern end thereof simon drew rein and looked on christopher as if he would ask him something but asked not then said christopher whither go we now said simon it is partly for thee to say hearken i am bidden first to ride the red water wood with thee knowest thou that yea said the lad full well but which way shall we ride it wilt thou come out of it at red water head or herne moss or the long pools said simon we shall make for the long pools if thou canst bring me there christopher laughed aha said he then i am some far away cousin of dr knowall when the whole tale is told forsooth i can lead thee thither but tell me what shall i do of valiant deeds at the long pools for there is no fire drake nor effet nay nor no giant nor guileful dwarf nor save mallard and coot heron and bitten yea and ague shivers to boot simon looked sourly on him and said thou art bidden to go with me young man or gainsay the marshal art thou mighty enough thereto for the rest fear not but that the deed shall come to thee one day nay said christopher it is all one to me for i am at home in these woods and wastes i am my shafts tell me of the deeds when thou wilt but indeed he longed to know the deed and fretted him because of simon's surliness and closeness then he said well squire simon let us to the road for thou shalt know that to-night we must needs house us under the naked heaven in no wise can we come to the long pools before to-morrow morning yea and why not said the squire i have lain in worse places wilt thou tell me thereof said christopher may happen said simon if to-morrow comes and goes for both of us twain so they rode their ways through the wood and baited at midday with what simon bare in his saddle-bags and then went on till night fell on them then asked simon how long they were from the long pools and christopher told him that they were yet short of them some fifteen miles and those long ones because of the marish grounds so they tethered their horses there and ate their supper and lay down to sleep in the house of the woods 
by a fireside which they lighted but in the midnight christopher who was exceeding fine-eared had an inkling of some one moving afoot anigh him and he awoke therewith and sprang up his drawn short sword in his hand and found himself face to face with simon and he also with his sword drawn simon sprang aback but held up his sword point and christopher not yet fully awake cried out what what wouldst thou what is it simon answered stammering and all abashed did didst thou not hear it then it wakened me i heard naught said christopher what was it horses going into the wood said simon ah yea said christopher it will have been the wild colts and mares they harbour about these marshland parts go to sleep again neighbour the night is not yet half worn but i will watch a while then simon sheathed his sword and turned about and stood uneasily a little while and then cast him down as one who would sleep hastily but slept not forsooth though he presently made semblance of it as for christopher he drew together the brands of the fire and sat beside it with his blade over his knees until the first beginning of the summer dawn was in the sky then he began to nod and presently lay aback and slept soundly simon slept not but durst not move so they lay till it was broad day and the sunbeams came thrusting through the boughs of the thicket chapter eight christopher comes to the tofts when they arose in the sunshine simon went straightway to see to the horses while christopher stayed by the fire to dight their victuals he was merry enough and sang to himself the while but when simon came back again christopher looked on him sharply but for a while simon would not meet his eye though he asked diverse questions of him concerning little matters as though he were fain to hear christopher's voice at last he raised his eyes and looked on him steadily and then christopher said well wayfarer mine and whither away this morning said simon as thou wottest to the long pools said the lad well thou keepest thy tidings so close that i will ask thee no more till we come to the long pools since there forsooth thou must needs tell me unless we sunder company there whereof i were naught grieving may happen thou shalt fare a long way to-day muttered simon but the lad cried out aloud while his eye glittered and his cheek flushed belike thou hast well nigh opened the door thereto last night and therewith he leapt to his feet and drew his short sword and with three deft strokes sheared asunder an overhanging beech bough as thick as a man's wrist that it fell crashing down and caught simon amongst the fall of its leafy twigs while christopher stood laughing on him but with a dangerous lofty look in his eyes then he turned away quietly toward the horses and mounted his nag and simon followed and did the like silently crestfallen he looked with brooding fierceness in his face so they rode their ways and spake but little to each other till they came to where the trees of the wood thinned speedily and gave out at last at the foot of a low stony slope but little grassed and when they had ridden up to the brow and could see below christopher stretched out his hand and said lo thou the long pools fellow wayfarer and lo some of the tramping horses that woke thee and not me last night forsooth there lay below them a great stretch of grass which wiles ran into mere quagmire and wiles was sound and better grassed and the said plain was seamed by three long shallow pools with as it were grassy causeways between them grown over here and there with ancient alder trees but the stony slope whereon they had reined up bent round the plain mostly to the east as though it were the shore of a great water and far away to the south the hills of the forest rose up blue and not so low at the most but that they were somewhat higher than the crest of the white horse as ye may see it from the little berkshire hills above the thames down on the firm greensward there was indeed a herd of wild horses feeding mallard and coot swam about the waters the wimbrel laughed from the bent sides and three herons stood on the side of the causeway seeking a good fishing stead simon sat a horseback looking askance from the marish to christopher and said nothing a while then he spake in a low croaking voice and said so little king we have come to the long pools now i will ask thee hast thou been further southward than this marish land that have i said the lad 
a day's journey further but according to the tales of men it was at the peril of my life simon seemed as if he had not noted his last word he said well then since thou knowest the wild and the wood knowest thou amidst of the thickets there two lumps of bare hills like bowls turned bottom up that rise above the trees and on each a tower and betwixt them a long house save us all hallows quoth christopher but thou wilt mean the toffs is it so sir squire even so said simon and thou knowest what dwellest there and wouldst have me lead thee thither said the lad i am so bidden said simon if thou wilt not do my bidding seek thou some place to hide thee in from the hand of the earl marshal said the youngling knowest thou not jack of the toffs and his seven sons and what he is and that he dwelleth there said simon i know of him yea and himself i know and that he dwelleth there and i wot that men call him an outlaw and that many rich men shall lack ere he lacks what then this said christopher that as all tales tell he will take my life if i ride thither and said he turning to simon this is belike what thou wouldest with me and therewith he drew out his sword for his bow was unstrung but simon sat still and let his sword abide and said sourly enough thou art a fool to think i am training thee to thy death by him for i have no will to die and why shall he not slay me also now again i say unto thee thou hast the choice either to lead me to the toffs where shall be the deed for thee to do or to hide thee in some hole as i said afore from the vengeance of the lord of oakenrealm but as for thy sword thou mayst put it up for i will not fight with thee but rather let thee go with a string to thy leg if thou wilt not be wise and do as thy lords ordain for thee christopher sheathed his sword and a smile came into his face as if some new thought were stirring in him and he said well since thou wilt not fight with me and i but a lad i will e'en do thy will and thine errand to jack of the toffs maybe he is not so black as he is painted and not all tales told of him are true but some of them i will tell thee as we ride along and some thereof i know already o woodland knight said simon as they rode down the bent and christopher led on toward the green causeway betwixt the waters tell me quoth he when they had ridden a while is one of thy tales how jack of the toffs went to the yule feast of a great baron in the guise of a minstrel and even as they bore in the boar's head smote the said baron on the neck so that his head lay by the head of the swine on the christmas board yea said christopher and how jack cried out two heads of swine one good to eat one good to burn but my master thou shalt know that this manslaying was not for naught whereas the baron of greenlake had erewhile slain jack's father in felon wise where he could strike no stroke for life and two of his brethren also had he slain and made the said jack an outlaw and he all sackless in the uttermost march we deemed that he had a case against the baron ha huh? said simon is this next tale true that this jack of the toff slew a good knight before the altar so that the priest's mass hackle was all wet with his blood whereas the said priest was in the act of putting the holy body into the open mouth of the said knight christopher said eagerly true was it by the rood and well was it done for that same sir raoul was an ugly traitor who had knelt down where he died to wed the body of the lord to a foul lie in his mouth whereas the man who knelt beside him he had trained to his destruction and was even then doing the first deal of his treason by forswearing him there then that man who knelt with him there said simon what be it to him said christopher he went out of the church with jack of the toffs that minute of the stroke and to the toffs he went with him and abode with him freely and a valiant man he was and is ha said simon again and then there is this that the seven sons of jack of the toffs bore off perforce four fair maidens of gentle blood from the castle wherein they dwelt serving a high dame in all honour and that moreover they hanged the said dame over the battlements of her own castle is this true fair sir true is it as the gospel said christopher yet many say that the hanged dame had somewhat less than her deserts for a foul and cruel whore had she been and done many to be done to death and stood by while they were pined and the like she had done with those four damsels had there not been the stout sons of jack of the toffs so that the dear maidens were somewhat more than willing to be borne away simon grinned well lad said he i see that thou knowest jack of the toffs even better than i do so why in the devil's name thou art loath to lead me to him i wot not christopher reddened and held his peace a while then he said well fellow fairer 
at least i shall know something of him ere next midnight yea said simon and shall we not come to the toffs before nightfall let us assay it said christopher and do our best it yet lacketh three hours of noon therewith he spurred on for the greensward was hard under the hoofs and they had yet some way to go before they should come amongst the trees and thickets into the said wood they came and rode all day diligently but night fell on them before they saw either house or man or devil then said simon why should we go any further before dawn will it not be best to come to this perilous house by daylight said christopher there be perils in the wood as well as in the house if we lie down here maybe jack's folk may come upon us sleeping and some mischance may befall us withal hereabouts be no wild horses to wake thee and warn thee of thy foeman and i let us press on there is a moon though she be somewhat hidden by clouds and meseemeth the way lieth clear before me neither are we a great way from the tofts then simon rode close up to christopher and took his rein and stayed him and said to him as one who prayeth young man willest thou my death that is as it may be said christopher willest thou mine simon held his peace a while and christopher might not see what was in his face amidst the gathering dusk but he twitched his rein out of the squire's hand as if he would hasten onward then the squire said nay i pray thee abide and hear a word of me speak then said christopher but hasten for i hunger and i would we were in the hall and therewith he laughed said simon thus it is if i go back to my lord and bear no token of having done his errand to jack of the tofts then am i in evil case and if i come to the tofts i wot well that jack is a man fierce of heart and ready of hand now therefore i pray thee give me thy word to be my warrant so far as thou mayst be with this woodman and his sons at that word christopher brake out a laughing loudly till all the dusk wood rang with the merry sound of his fresh voice at last he said well well thou art but a craven to be a secret murderer the lord god would have had an easy bargain of cain had he been such as thou come on and do thine errand to jack of the toffs and i will hold thee harmless so far as i may though sooth to say i guessed what thine errand was after the horses waked thee and put a naked sword in thine hand last night marry i had no inkling of it when we left the castle yesterday morning but deem thy lord needed me to do him some service come on then or rather go thou on before me apace there where thou seest the glimmer betwixt the beech trees yonder if thou goest astray i am anigh thee for a guide and i say that we shall not go far without tidings simon went on perforce as he was bidden and they rode thus a while slowly christopher now and then crying as they went to the right squire to the left straight on now and so on but suddenly they heard voices and it was as if the wood had all burst out into fire so bright a light shone out christopher shouted and hastened on to pass simon going quite close to his right side thereby and as he did so he saw steel flashing in his hand and turned sidling to guard him but ere he could do aught simon drave a broad dagger into his side and then turned about and fled the way they had come so far as he knew how Christopher fell from his horse at once as the stroke came home, but straightway therewith were there men with torches round about him, a dozen of them, men tall and wild-looking in the firelight, and one of them, a slim young man with long red hair falling all about his shoulders, knelt down by him, while the others held his horse and gat his feet out of the stirrups. The redhead laid his hand on his breast, and raised his head up till the light of a torch fell on it and then he cried out masters here hath been a felon the man hath been sticked and the deed hath to do with us for lo you this is none other than the little christopher of the uttermost march who stumbled on the toffs last yule and with whom we were so merry together here thou robert of maisie do thy leechdom on him if he be yet living but if he be dead or dieth of his hurt then do i take the feud on me to follow it to the utmost against the slayer even i david the red though i be the youngest of the sons of jack of the tofts for this man i meant should be my fellow in field and fell ganging and galloping in hall and high place in cot and in choir before woman and warrior and priest and proud prince now thou robert how does he said the man who had looked to christopher's wound and had put aside his coat and shirt 
he is so hurt but me seemeth not deadly nay belike he may live as long as thou a longer whereas thou wilt ever be shoving thy red head and lank body wheresoever knocks are going david rose with a sigh of one who is lightened of a load and said well robert when thou hast bound his wound let us have him into the house oh lads there is light enough to cut some boughs and make a litter for him but oh again has no one gone after the felon to take him robert grinned up from his job with the hurt man nay king david said he it is mostly thy business may happen thou wilt lay thy heels on thy neck and after him the redhead stamped on the ground and half drew his sacks and shoved it back again on to the sheath and then said angrily i marvel at thee robert that thou didst not send a man or two at once after the felon how may i leave my comrade and sweet board fellow lying hurt in the wild wood art thou growing over old for our woodland ways wherein loitering bringeth louting robert chuckled and said i thought thou wouldst take the fly in thy mouth foster son if the felon escape ralph longshanks and anthony green then hath he the devil's look and they be after him that is well said the young man though i would i were with them and therewith he walked up and down impatiently while the others were getting ready the litter of boughs at last it was done and christopher laid thereon and they all went on together through the woodland path the torches still flaring about them presently they came out into a clearing of the wood and lo looming great and black before them against the sky where the moon had now broken out of the clouds somewhat the masses of the toffs and at the top of the northernmost of them a light in the upper window of a tall square tower withal the yellow litten windows of a long house showed on the plain below the tofts but little else of the house might be seen save that as they drew near the walls break out in doubtful light here and there as the torches smote them so came they to a deep porch where they quenched all the torches save one and entered a great hall through it david and two other tall young men going first and robert maisie going beside the bier the said hall was lighted with candles but not very brightly save at the upper end but amidmost a flickering heap of logs sent a thin line of blue smoke up to the luffer there were some sixty folk in the hall scattered about the end-long tables a good few of whom were women well grown and comely enough so far as could be seen under the scanty candlelight at the high table withal were sitting both men and women and as they drew near to the greater light of it there could be seen in the chief seat a man past middle age tall wide-shouldered and thin-flanked with a short peaked beard and close-cut grizzled hair he was high of cheekbones thin-faced with grey eyes both big and gentle-looking he was clad in a green coat welted with gold beside him sat a woman tall and big made but very fair of face though she were little younger belike than the man out from these two sat four men and four women man by man and woman by woman on either side of the high seat of the said men one was of long red hair as david and like to him in all wise but older the others were of like fashion to him in the high seat shortly to say it his sons they were as david and the two young men with him the four women who sat with these men were all fair and young and one of them she who drank out of the redhead's cup so fair and with such a pleasant slim grace that her like were not easy to be found again to shorten the tale there in the hall before christopher who lay on wotting were jack of the toffs and his seven sons and the four wives of four of the same whom they had won from the wailful castle when they with their father put an end to the evil woman and the great she-tyrant of the land betwixt the wood and the river now when david and his were come up to the dais they stayed them and their father spake from his high seat and said what is it to do ye three and what catch of thee said david i would fain hope tis the catch of a life that or i love for here is come thy guest of last yule and even little christopher who wrestled with thee and threw thee after thou hadst thrown all of us and he lying along and hurt smitten down by a felon hard on our very doors what will ye do with him what said jack of the toffs but tend him and heal him and cherish him and when he's well then we shall see but where is the felon who smote him said david 
he fled away a horseback ere we came to the field of deed and anthony green and ralph longshanks are gone after him and belike will take him may happen not said the master now forsooth i have an inkling of what this may mean whereas there can be but one man whose business may be the taking of our little guest's life but let all be till he be healed and may tell us his tale and if he telleth it as i deem he will then shall we seek further tidings meanwhile if ye take the felon keep him heedfully till i may see him for then may i have a true tale out of him even before christopher is hale again so therewith david and robert with two or three others brought christopher to a chamber and did what leached them to him as they might but jack of the tofts and his sons and their fair wives and his other folk made merry in the hall of the tofts End of part two Part three of Child Christopher and Goldilind the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine Squire Simon comes back to Oakenham, the Earl Marshal taken to King in Oakenrealm now as to squire simon whether the devil helped him or his look or whether it was his own cunning and his horse's stoutness we wot not but in any case he fell not in with ralph longshanks and anthony green but rode as far and as fast as his horse would go and then lay down in the wildwood and on the morrow arose and went his ways and came in the even to the castle of the uttermost march and went on thence the morrow after on a fresh horse to oakenham there he made no delay but went straight to the high house and had privy speech of the earl marshal and him he told how he had smitten christopher and as he deemed slain him the earl marshal looked on him grimly and said where is the ring then i have it not said simon how might i lie down to take it when the seven sons were hard on us and therewith he told him all the tale and how he had risen to slay christopher the even before and how he had found out after that the youngling had become guest and fosterling of the folk of the tofts and how warily christopher had ridden so that he simon had to do his best at the last moment and now lord quoth he i see that it will be my look to have grudging of thee or even worse it may be yea and thou wilt be presently telling me that i am a liar and never struck the stroke but i warrant me that by this time jack of the tofts knoweth better for i left my knife in the youngling's breast and belike he wotteth of my weapons well then if thou wilt be quit of me thou hast but to forbear upholding me against the toft folk and then i am gone without any to do of thee earl rolf spake quietly in answer though his face was somewhat troubled nay simon i doubt thee not not one word for why shouldst thou lie to me nor do i deem thou wouldest for thou art trusty and worthy yet sore i doubt if the child be dead well even so let it be for i am alive and full surely i am mightier than jack of the tofts both to uphold thee against him wherein i shall not fail and otherwise but may god make me even as that young man if i be not mightier yet in a few days but now do thou go and eat and drink and take thy disport for thou hast served me well and in a little while i shall make thee knight and lord and do all i can to pleasure thee so then simon knelt to the earl and made obeisance to him and arose and went his ways light-hearted and merry but within the month it so befell that some of the lords and dukes came to the earl marshal and prayed him to call together a great folk mote of all oaken realm and he answered them graciously and behight them to do as they would and even so did he and that mote was very great and when as it was hallowed there arose a great lord grey and ancient and bewailed him before the folk that they had no king over oaken realm to uphold the laws and ward the land and will ye live bare and kingless for ever said he at last will ye not choose you a king and crown him before i die as we others of the realm who are old and worn then he sat down and another arose and in plain terms he bade them take the earl marshal to king and then arose one after other 
and each sang the same song till the hearts of the people grew warm with the big words and at first many and then more cried out a king a king the earl marshal for king earl rolf for king so that at last the voices rose into a great roar and sword clashed on shield and they who were about the earl turned to him and upraised him on a great war shield and he stood thereon above the folk with a naked sword in his hand and all the folk shouted about him thereafter the chiefs and all the mightiest came and did homage to him for king of oakenrealm as he sat on the hill of the folk moat and that night there was once more a king of oakenrealm and earl rolf was no more but king rolf ruled the people but now the tale leaves telling of him and turns again to christopher the woodman who lay sick of his hurt in the house of the tofts chapter ten of christopher at the tofts christopher was six weeks ere he could come and go as he was wont but it was but a few days ere he was well enough to tell his tale to jack of the tofts and his seven bold sons and they cherished him and made much of him and so especially did david the youngest son to his board fellow and troth brother on a day when he was well nigh whole as he sat under an oak tree nigh the house in the cool of the evening jack of the tofts came to him and sat beside him and made him tell his tale to him once more and when he was done he said to him foster son for so i would have thee deem thyself what is the thing that thou rememberest earliest in thy days said christopher a cot without the castle walls at the uttermost marches and a kind woman therein big sandy-haired and freckled and a lad that was white-haired and sturdy somewhat bigger than i and i mind me standing up against the door-post of the cot and seeing men-at-arms riding by in white armour and one of them throwing an apple to me and i raised my arm to throw it back at him but my nurse for somehow i knew she was not my mother caught my hand and drew me back indoors and i heard the men laughing behind me and then a little after my nurse took me into the castle court and there was again the man who had thrown me the apple sitting on a bench therein clad in a scarlet gown furred with brown fur and she led me up to him and he stooped down and chucked me under the chin and put his hand on my head and looked at my nurse and said yea he's a big lad and groweth apace whereas he is but of six winters nay lord said my nurse he is but scantly five he knit his brows and said nay i shall tell thee he is six she shook her head but said naught and the great man scowled on her and said mistress wilt thou set thy word against mine know now that this child is of six years now then how old is he she said faintly six years said he look to it that thy head and thy mouth forget it not else shall we make thy back remember it then he put his hand on my head again and said well i say thou art a big lad for six years and therewith he gave me a silver penny and even as he spake came up a grey clad squire to him and looked on me curiously then i went away with my nurse and wondered why she was grown so pale whereas she was mostly red-cheeked and jolly but when she had brought me into the cot again she kissed me and clipped me weeping sorely the while wherefore i wept though i know not why sith hence i soon came to know that the man was the lord and governor of the castle as ye may well wot but to this hour i know not what he meant by threatening my nurse said jack and how old art thou now christopher mine said the youngling laughing by my lord the castellan's reckoning i am twenty and two years but if thou wilt trow my good and kind nurse that yet liveth a kind dame thou must take twelve months off the tale jack sat silent a little then he laughed and said well thou art a mickle babe christopher and it may be that one day many a man shall know it but now tell me again thou hast said to me before that thou hast known neither father nor mother brothers nor sisters is it so verily said christopher never a kinsman of blood have i though many well-wishers said jack well now hast thou father and mother brethren and sisters though they be of the sort of manslayers and strong thieves and outlaws yet they love thee lad and thou mayst one day find out how far thou mayst trust them christopher nodded and smiled at him merrily then he fell silent a while and the outlaw sat looking on him at last he said suddenly foster father tell me what i am and of what kindred i pray thee 
for methinks thou knowest thereof and what wonder wise man as thou art forsooth son christopher i have a deeming thereof or somewhat more and when it is waxen greater yet i will tell it thee one day but not now but hearken for i have other tidings for thee thou art now whole and strong and in a few days thou mayst wend the wild wood as stoutly as e'er a one of us now therefore how sayest thou if i bid thee fare a two days journey with david and gilbert thy brethren and thy sister joanna till they bring thee to a fair little stead which i call my own to dwell there a while for me seemeth lad that the air of the toff say may not be over wholesome unto thee christopher reddened and he half rose up and said what is this foster father is it that there shall be a battle at the toffs and that thou wouldst have me away thence am i then such a weakling said jack laughing be still now thou sticked one the toffs go down to battle at some whiles but seldom come at battle to the toffs and no battle do i look for now but do my bidding sweet fosterling and it will be better for me and better for thee and may perchance put off battle for a while which to me as now were not unhandy if thou wilt but abide at littledale for some while there shall be going and coming betwixt us and thou shalt drink thy yule at the toffs and go back afterwards and ever shalt thou have thy sweet fellows with thee so be wise since thou goest not perforce yea yea said christopher laughing thou puttest force on no man is it not so foster father wherefore i will go and uncompelled therewith came up to them from out of the wildwood david and with him joanna who was the wife of gilbert and one of those fair maidens from the wailful castle though not the fairest of them they had been a hunting for ever those three would willingly go together gilbert david and joanna and now gilbert had abided behind to dight the quarry for fetching home christopher looked on the two joyfully as a man getting whole after sickness smiles on goodly things and joanna was fair to see in her hunter's attire with brogues tied to her naked feet and the shapeliness of her legs bare to the knee beneath the trussing up of her green skirts they greeted christopher kindly and joanna sat down by him to talk but jack of the toffs took his son by the arm and went toward the house with him in earnest speech chapter eleven how christopher came to littledale to abide there a while in about a week's time from this those four fellows went their way southward from the toffs having with them four good nags and four sumpter beasts laden with such things as they needed whereof were weapons enough though they all save christopher bare bows and he and the others were girt with swords and a leash of good dogs followed them two milch kine also they drave with them merry they were all as they went their ways through the woods but the gladness of christopher was even past words wherefore after a little he spake scarce at all but sat in his saddle hearkening the tales and songs and jests of his fellows who went close beside him for more often they went afoot than rode and forsooth as the sweet morning wore it seemed to him so great was his joy as if all the fair show of the greenery and the boles of the ancient oaks and the squirrels running from bough to bough and the rabbits scuttling from under the bracken, and the hind leaping in the woodlawn, and the sun falling through the rustling leaves, and the wind on his face, and the scent of the forest, yea, and his fair companions, and their loveliness and valiancy and kindness, and the woods and songs that came from their dear mouths. All these seemed to him, as it were, one great show done for the behoof and pleasure of him, the man who came from the peril of death and the sick-bed, they lay that night in all glee under the green boughs and arose on the morrow and went all day and again slept in the greenwood and the next morning came down into a fair valley which was indeed littledale through which ran a pleasant little river and on a grassy knoll but a short way from its bank was a long framed hall somewhat narrow and naught high whitherward they turned them straightway and were presently before the door then gilbert drew a key from out of his scrip and unlocked the door and they entered and found within a fair little hall with shut beds out from it on the further side and kitchen and store bowers at the end all things duly appointed with plenishing and meal and wine 
for it was but some three months since one of jack of the toff's allies sir launcelot green and his wife and two bairns had left it till their affair was made straight whereas he had dwelt there a whole year for he had been made an outlaw of Meadham, and was a dear friend of the said Jack. Now, said David, smiling, here is now thy high house and thy castle, little King Christopher. How doth it like thee? Right well, said Christopher, and to say sooth I would almost that it were night, and my bones do else, that I might lie naked in a bed. Nay, lad, said Gilbert, make it night now, and we will do all that needs must be done, while thou liest lazy, as all kings used to do. Nay, said Christopher, I will be more a king than so, for I will do neither this nor that. I will not work, and I will not go to bed, but will look on till it is time for me to take to the crooked stick and the grey goose wing, and seek venison. That is better than well, said David, for I can see by thine eyes that are dancing with pleasure, that in three or four days thou wilt be about the thickets with us. Meantime, said Joanna, thou shalt pay for thy meat and drink by telling us tales when we come home weary yea said christopher laughing that ye may go to sleep before your time so they talked and were joyous and blithe together and between them they made the house trim and decked it with boughs and blossoms and though christopher told them no tale that night joanna and david sang both and in a night or two it was christopher that was the minstrel so when the morrow came there began their life of the woodland but save for the changing of the year and the chances of the hunt the time passed on from day to day with little change and it was but seldom that any man came their way when yule was they locked the house door behind them and went their ways home to the toffs and now of all these wayfarers was christopher by far the hardest and strongest for his side had utterly forgotten simon's knife at the tofts they were welcomed with all triumph and they were about there in the best of cheer till it was wearing toward candlemas and then they took occasion of a bright and sunny day to go back to littledale once more and there they abode till spring was come and was wearing into summer and messages had come and gone betwixt them and the tofts and it was agreed that with the first of autumn they should go back to the tofts and see what should be tied but now leave we Christopher and these good fellows of the Toffs and turn to Goldilind, who is yet dwelling amid no very happy days in the castle of Green Harbour on the northernmost marshes of Meadham. Chapter 12 Of Goldilind in the May Morning at Green Harbour May was on the land now, and was come into its second week, and Goldilind awoke on a morn in the castle of Green Harbour, but little did her eyes behold of the May, even when they were fully open, for she was lying, not in her own chamber, which was proper, and even somewhat stately, and from when she could look on the sky and greenwood, but in a chamber low down amidst the footings of the wall, little lighted, unadorned, with naught in it for sport or pleasure, naught forsooth save the pallet's bed on which she lay, a joint stool and water ewer. To be short, though it were called the least guard chamber, it was a prison, and she was there dreeing her penance, as Dame Eleanor would call the cruelty of her malice, which the chaplain, Dame Eleanor's led captain, had ordained her for some sin which the twain had forged between them. She lay there naked in her smock, with no raiment anigh her, and this was the third morning whereon she had awakened to the dusky bare walls, and a long while had their emptiness made of the hours. But she lay quiet and musing, not altogether without cheer now, for indeed she was not wont to any longer penance than this she had but now thold. So she looked for release presently, and moreover there had grown in her mind during those three days a certain purpose, to wit, that she would get hold of the governor of the castle privily, and two or three others of the squires who most regarded her, and bewail her case to them, so that she might perchance get some relief. Forsooth, as she called to mind this resolve, her heart beat and her cheek flushed, for well she knew that there was peril in it, and she forecast what might be the worst that could come thereof, while, on the other hand, the best that might be seemed to her like a glimpse of paradise. As she lay there and turned the matter over in her mind for this many an hundred time, there came a key into the lock, and the door opened, 
and thereby entered a tall woman dark-haired white-skinned somewhat young and not ill-favoured goldilin still lay there till the newcomer said to her in a harder voice wherein was both threatening and mockery rise up our lady the dame eleanor saith that it is enough and that thou art to go forth nay hold a while for i say unto thee that it is yet early in the day and that thy chamber is not yet dight for thee so thou must needs bestow thyself elsewhere till it be done goldiland rose up and said smiling yea alois but thou hast not brought my raiment and thou seest the maid stood looking at her a moment somewhat evilly and then said well since it is but scant six o'clock i may do that but i bid thee ask me not over much for me seemeth dame eleanor is not over well pleased with thee to-day nor our chaplain either therewith she turned and went out locking the door behind her and came back presently bearing on her arm a green gown and other raiment she laid them on the stool before the lady and said hasten my lady and let me go to my place sooth to say it may well be double trouble to thee to don thy clothes for thou mayst have to doff them again before long goldilind answered naught but reddened and paled again as she clad her under the waiting maid's eyes then they went out together and up a short stone stair till they were level with the greensward without then the maid turned to goldilind and said and now thou art clad and out my lady i wot not where thou art to go since to thy chamber thou must not go nay hold and hearken here we be at the door which opens on to the forester's garth under the forester's tower thither shalt thou abide till i come to fetch thee how now my lady what else wouldst thou goldilin looked on her with a smile yet with eager eyes and said oh good eloise wouldst thou but give me a piece of bread for i hunger thou wottest my queenly board has not been overloaded these last days ha said eloise if thou ask me over much i fear thou mayst pay for it my lady but this last asking thou shalt have and then none other till all thy penance thou hast dreed abide therewith she went up the stairs and goldilind who now was but weak with her prison and the sudden light and the hope and fear of her purpose of bewailing her story sat her down on the stair there almost as it were twixt home and hell till her heart came back to her and the tears began to flow from her eyes forthright came back eloise bearing a white loaf and a little pitcher of milk on a silver serving dish she laid them down unlocked the door into the garden and thrust goldilin through by the shoulders then she turned and took up her serving dish with the bread and milk and handed it to goldilin through the door and said now is my lady served if it were indeed well that my lady should strengthen herself this hour for the hour next to come therewith she turned about and shut and locked the door and the king's daughter fell to eagerly on her bread and thought of little till she had eaten and drunk save that she felt the sweet scent of the gillyflowers and eglantine as it were a part of her meal then she went slowly down the garden treading the greensward beside the flowers and she looked on the hold and the low sun gilded the walls thereof and glittered in a window here and there and though there was on her a foreboding of the hours of that day she did what she might to make the best of the fragrant may morning and the song of birds and rustle of leaves though indeed at whiles the tears would gush out of her eyes when she thought how young she was and how feeble and the pity of herself became sweet unto her chapter thirteen of goldilind in the garth now as she went in that garden with her face turned toward the postern which led into the open space of the greenwood which was but two bowshots from the thicket she heard the clatter of the horse hoofs on the loose stones of the path and how they stopped at the said postern and presently there was a key in the lock the door opened and a man came in walking stiffly like a rider who has ridden far and fast he was clad in jack and sallet and had a sword by his side and on his sleeve was done in green and gold a mountain of flame so that goldilin knew him at once for a man of earl jeffreys and indeed she had seen the man before coming and going on errands that she knew naught of and on which nothing followed that was of import to her therefore 
as she watched him cross the garden and go straight up to the door of the forester's tower and take out another key and enter she heeded him but little nor did his coming increase her trouble a whit she walked on toward the postern and now she saw that the errand-bearer had left it open behind him and when she came close up to it she saw his horse tied to a ring in the wall a strong and good bay nag the sight of him and the glimpse of the free and open land stirred in her the misery of her days and the yearning for the loveliness of the world without converse of friends hope of the sufficiency of desire and the sweetness of love returned and so a strong wave of anguish swept over her that she bowed her down upon the grass and wept bitterly yet but a little while it lasted she rose up presently and looked warily all round her and up to the castle and saw none stirring she drew up the skirts of her green gown into her girdle till the hem but just hid her knees then she stepped lightly through the half-open door with flushed cheeks and glittering eyes while her heart rose within her then she lifted her hand unhitched the reins from the iron ring and quietly led the horse close under the garth wall and stole gently up the slope which as all roads from the castle went straightway toward the thicket but this was the straightest so she went till she came to the corner of the garth wall and a little further and the castle on that side was blind save for the swale on the battlements whereon in that deep peace was little going and moreover it was not even yet six o'clock end of part three Part four of Child Christopher and Goldilind the Fair by William Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen. Goldilind goes free. There she stayed the horse and, flushed and panting, got lightly into the saddle and bestrode it, and leaning over on the beast's neck, smote his flanks with her heels. The horse was fresh, though his master had been weary whereas the said messenger had gotten him from a forester some six miles away in the wood that morning so the nag answered to her call for speed and she went a great gallop into the wood and was hidden in a twinkling from any eyes that might be looking out of the castle without checking the nag she sped along half mad with joy at the freedom of this happy morn nigh aimless she was but had an inkling that it were well with her if she could hold northward ever for the old man aforesaid had told her of oaken realm and how it lay northward of them so that way she drifted as the thickets would suffer her when she had gone as much of a gallop as she might for some half hour she drew rein to breathe her nag and hearkened she turned in the saddle but heard naught to affright her so she went on again but somewhat more soberly and thuswise she rode for some two hours and the day waxed hot and she was come to a clear pool amidst of a little clearing covered with fine greensward right down to the water's edge there she made stay and got off her horse and stood a while by him as he cropped the sweet grass and the birds sang at the edge of the thicket and the rabbits crept and gambled on the other side of the water and from the pool's edge the moorhens cried she stood half leaning against the side of the horse till she became somewhat drowsy yea and even dreamed a little and that's little but ill it seemed as she gave a troubled cry and shrank together and turned pale then she rubbed her eyes and smiled and turned to the pool where now a little ripple was running over the face of it and a thought came upon her and she set her hand to the clasp of her gown and undid it and drew the gown off her shoulders and so did off all her raiment and stood naked a little on the warm sunny grass and then bestirred her and went lightly into the pool and bathed and sported there and then came unto the grass again and went to and fro to dry her in the air and sun then she did on her raiment again and laid her down under a thorn bush by the pool side and there would she would she not went to sleep soundly and dreamed not and when she awoke she deemed her sleep had been long but it was not so but scarce a score of minutes anyhow she sprang up now and went to her horse and drew the girths tight which she had loosed erewhile 
and so bestrode the good horse and shook the reins and rode away much comforted and enheartened chapter fifteen of goldilind in the wild wood goldilind rode on hastening yet to put as many miles as she might betwixt her and green harbour within a three hours from her bathing she fell a hungering sore and knew not what to do to eat till she found a pouch made fast to the saddle-bow and therein a little white loaf that and no more which she took and ate the half of with great joy sitting down by a brookside when she had her drink then again she mounted and rode on till dusk overtook her just as she came to a little river running from the north from pool to shallow and shallow to pool and whereas she was now exceeding weary and the good horse also much spent and that the grass was very sweet and soft down to the water's edge and that there was a thick thorn bush to cover her she made up her mind that this place should be her bedchamber so she took saddle and bridle off the horse as he must needs bite the grass and then when she had eaten the other half of her bread she laid her down on the green grass with her head on the saddle and when she had lain listening to the horse cropping the grass close to nigh her for a minute or two she fell fast asleep and lay there long and had no dreams chapter sixteen what goldilind found in the wood when she awoke it was broad day and bright sun and she rose up to her feet and looked about and saw the horse standing close by and sharing the shade with her whisking his tail about lazily then she turned and saw the stream rippling out from the pool over the clean gravel and here and there a fish darting through the ripple or making clean rings on the pool as he quietly took a fly the sky was blue and clear there was scarce a breath of air and the morning was already hot no worse than yesterday sang the birds in the bushes but as she looked across the river where forsooth the alders grew thick about the pool's edge a cock blackbird and then another flew out from the close boughs where they had been singing to their mates with the sharp cry that they use when they are frighted withal she saw the bush move though as aforesaid the morning was without wind she had just stooped to do off her footgear for she was minded to bathe again but now she stopped with one shoe in her hand and looked on the bushes keenly with beating heart and again she thought she saw the boughs shaken and stood not daring to move a while but they moved no more now when she had looked steadily at them a space and again a blackbird began singing loud just where they had been shaken so she gathered heart again and presently turned her hand once more to stripping her raiment off her for she would not be balked of her bath but when the stripping was done she loitered not naked on the bank as she had done the day before but walked swiftly to the shallow and thence down into the pool till nothing but her head and the whiteness of her shoulders showed over the dark water even then she turned her head about twice to look into the overside bushes but when she saw nothing stir there she began to play in the water but not for long but came splashing through the shallow and hurried on her raiment when she was clad again she went up to the horse and patted and caressed him and did bridle and saddle on him and was going to climb upon him when of a sudden she thought she would lead him across lest there should be a hole near the other bank and he might stumble into it unwarily so she bared her feet once more and trussed up her gown skirts and so took the ford leading the beast the water was nowhere up to mid leg of her and she stepped ashore on to short and fine grass which spread like a meadow before her with a big thorn or two scattered about it and a little grassy hill beset with tall elms toward the top coming down into the flat of the meadow and drawing round it nearly up to the river on the north side but now she stood staring in wonder and some deal of fear for there were three milch kine feeding on the meadow and moreover under a thorn scarce a hundred yards from where she stood was a tall man standing gazing on her so stricken was she that she might neither cry out nor turn aside neither did she think to pull her gown out of her girdle to cover the nakedness of her legs 
when they had thus stood a little while the man began to move toward her very slowly nor did she dare to flee any the more but when he was within half a dozen paces her face flushed red and she did pull her gown out of its trusses and let it flow down but he spake to her in a pleasant voice and said may i speak to thee maiden fear was yet in her soul so that she might not speak for a little and then she said oh i beseech thee bring me not back to green harbour and she paled sorely as she spake the word but he said i wot not of green harbour how to find the way there too though we have heard of it but comfort thyself i pray thee there is naught to fear in me the sound of his voice was full pleasant to her and when she hearkened him how kind and frank it was then she knew how much of terror was blent with her joy in her newly won freedom and the delight of the kind and happy words yet still she spoke not and was both shamefast and still not altogether unafraid yet sooth to say though his attire was but simple he was naught wild or fierce to look on from time to time she looked on him and then dropped her eyes again in those glances she saw that he was grey-eyed and smooth-cheeked and round-chinned and his hair curly and golden and she must needs think that she had never seen any face half so fair he was clad but in a green coat that came not down to his knees and brogues were tied to his feet and no more raiment he had and for hat he had made him a garland of white may blossom and well it sat there and again she looked on him and thought him no worse than the running angel that goes before the throne of god in the picture of the choir of Meadhamstead, and she looked on him and marvelled now she hung her head before him and wished he would speak and even so did he and said maiden when i first saw thee from amidst of the bush by the river yonder i deemed thou wert a woodwhite or some one of the she-gods of the gentiles come back hither for this is a lonely place and some might deem that the devil hath might here more than in other places and when i saw thee that thou wouldst do off thy raiment to bathe thee though soothly i longed to lie hidden there i feared thee lest thou shouldst be angry with me if i were to see thee unclad so i came away yet i went not far for i was above all things yearning to see thee and sooth it is that hadst thou not crossed the water i should presently have crossed it myself to seek thee wert thou goddess or woodwife or whatever might have come of it but now thou art come to us and i have heard thy voice beseeching me not to bring thee to green harbour i see that thou art a woman of the kindred of adam and yet so it is that now i fear thee somewhat yet i will pray thee not to be wroth if i ask thee whether i may do aught for thy need now she began somewhat to smile and she looked him full in the face and said forsooth my need is simple for i am hungry he smote himself on the breast and said see now what a great fool i am not to have known it without telling instead of making long-winded talk about myself come quickly dear maiden and leave thine horse to crop the grass so he hurried on to the thorn-bush aforesaid and she went foot to foot with him but he touched her not and straightway she sat her down on the root of the thorn and smiled frankly on him and said nay sir and now thou hast made me go all this way i am out of breath and weary so i pray thee of the victual at once but he had been busy with his scrip which he had left cast down there and therewithal reached out to her a mighty hunch of bread and a piece of white cheese and said now shall i fetch thee milk wherewith he took up a bowl of aspen tree that had lain by the scrip and ran off to one of the kine and milked the bowl full and came back with it heedfully and set it down beside her and said this was the nighest thing to hand but when thou hast eaten and rested then shall we go to our house if thou wilt be so kind to me for there have we better meat and wine to boot she looked up at him smiling but her pleasure of the meat and the kindness was so exceeding that she might not refrain from tears also but she spake not as for him he knelt beside her looking on her wistfully and at last he said i shall tell thee that i am glad that thou wert hungry and that i have seen thee eating else might i have deemed thee somewhat other than a woman of mankind even yet she said yea and why wouldst thou not believe my word thereto he sat reddening i almost fear to tell thee 
lest thou think me overbold and be angry with me nay she said tell me for i would know said he the words are not easy in my rude mouth but this is what i mean that though i be young i have seen fair women not a few but beside any of them thou art a wonder and loath i were if thou wert not really of mankind if it were but for the glory of the world she hung her head and answered nought a while and he also seemed ashamed but presently she spake thou hast been kind to us wouldst thou tell us thy name and then if it like thee what thou art lady he said my name is easy to tell i hight christopher and whilst folk in merry mockery call me christopher king me seems because i am the least of account of all carls as for what else i am a woodman i am an outlaw and the friend of them yet i tell thee i have never by my will done any harm to any child of man and those friends of mine who are outlaws also are kind and loving with me both man and woman though needs must they dwell aloof from king's courts and barons halls she looked at him wondering and as if she did not altogether understand him and she said where dost thou dwell he said to-day i dwell hard by though where i shall dwell to-morrow who knows and with me are dwelling three of my kind fellows and the dearest is a young man of mine own age who is my fellow in all matters for us to live and die each for the other couldst thou have seen him thou wouldst love him i deem what name hath he said goldilind he hight david said christopher but therewith he fell silent and knit his brow as though he were thinking of some knotty point but in a while his face cleared and he said if i durst i would ask thee thy name and what thou art as to my name said she i will not tell it thee as now as to what i am i am a poor prisoner and much have i been grieved and tormented so that my body hath been but a thing whereby i might suffer anguish something else am i but i may not tell thee what as yet he looked on her long and then arose and went his way along the very track of their footsteps and he took the horse and brought him back to the thorn and stood by the lady and reddened and said i must tell thee what i have been doing these last minutes yea said she looking at him wonderingly hast thou not been fetching my horse to me so it is said he but something else also ask me or i cannot tell thee she laughed and said what else fair sir said he ask me what or i cannot tell thee well what then said she he answered stammering and blushing i have been looking at thy footprints whereby thou camest up from the water to see what new and fairer blossoms have come up in the meadow where thy feet were set e'en now she answered him nothing and he held his peace but in a while she said if thou wouldst have us come to thine house thou shalt lead us thither now and therewith she took her foot-gear from out of her girdle as if she would do it on and he turned his face away but sighed therewith then she reddened and put them back again and rose up lightly and said i will go afoot and wilt thou lead the horse for me so did he and led her by all the softest and most flowery ways turning about the end of a spur of the little hill that came close to the water and going close to the lip of the river and when they had thus turned about the hill there was a somewhat wider vale before them grassy and fair and on a knoll not far from the water a long frame house thatched with reed then said christopher lady this is now little dale and yonder the house thereof she said quietly lovely is the dale and fair the house by seeming and i would that they may be happy that dwell therein said christopher wilt thou not speak that blessing within the house as without fain were i thereof she said and therewith they came into the garth wherein the apple trees were blossoming and goldilin spread abroad her hands and lifted up her head for joy of the sight and the scent and they stayed a while before they went on to the door which was half open for they feared none in that place and looked for none whom they might not deal with if he came as a foe christopher would have taken a hand of her to lead her in but both hands were in her gown to lift up the hem as she passed over the threshold so he durst not fair and bright now was the hall within with its long and low windows goodly glazed 
a green hauling on the walls of adam and eve and the garden and the good god walking therein the sun shone bright through the southern windows and about the porch it was hot but further toward the dais cool and pleasant so goldilin sat down in the coolest of the place at the standing table but christopher bestirred himself and brought wine and white bread and venison and honey and said i pray thee to dine maiden for it is now hard on noon and as for my fair fellows i look not for them before sunset for they were going far into the wood she smiled on him and ate and drank a little deal and he with her sooth to say her heart was full and though she had forgotten her fear she was troubled because for as glad as she was she could not be as glad as her gladness would have her for the sake of some lack she knew not what now spake christopher i would tell thee something strange to wit though it is a little more than three hours since i first saw thee beside the river yet i seem to know thee as if thou wert a part of my life she looked on him shyly and he went on this also is strange and withal it likes me not that when i speak of my fair fellows here david and gilbert and joanna they are half forgotten to my heart though their names are on my tongue and this house doth it like thee fair guest yea much she said it seems joyous to me and i shall tell thee that i have mostly dwelt in unmerry houses though they were of greater cost than this said christopher to me it hath been merry and happy enough but now it seems to me as if it had all been made for thee and this meeting is it therefore no longer merry to thee because of that she said smiling yet flushing much red therewith now it was his turn not to answer her and she cast down her eyes before him and there was silence between them then she looked at him steadily and said it is indeed grievous that thou shouldest forget thine own friends for me and that it should have come into thy mind that this fair and merry house was not made for thy fair fellows and thy delight with them but for me the chance comer for hearken whereas thou saidst e'en now that i was become a part of thy life how can that be for if i become the poor captive again how canst thou get to me thou who art thyself a castaway as thou hast told me yea but even so i shall be too low for thee to come down to me and if i become what i should be then i must tell thee that i shall be too high for thee to climb up to me so that in one way or another we shall be sundered who have but met for an hour or two he hung his head a while as they stood there face to face for both of them had arisen from the board but presently he looked up to her with glittering eyes and said yea for an hour or two why then do we tarry and linger and say what we have no will to say and refrain from what our hearts bid us therewith he caught hold of her right wrist and laid his hand on her left shoulder and this first time that he had touched her it was as if a fire ran through all his body and changed it into the essence of her neither was there any naysay in her eyes nor any defence against him in the yielding body of her but even in that nick of time he drew back a little and turned his head as a man listening toward the door and said hiss hiss dost thou hear maiden she turned deadly pale oh what is it what is it yea i hear it is horses drawing nigh and the sound of hounds baying but may it not be thy fellows coming back nay nay he said they rode not in armour hark to it and these hounds are deep-voiced sleuth dogs but come now there may yet be time he turned and caught up axe and shield from off the wall and drew her toward a window that looked to the north and peered out of it warily but turned back straightway and said nay it is too late that way they are all around about the house maiden get thou up into the solar by this stair and thou wilt find hiding-place behind the traverse of the bed and if they go away and my fellows come in due time then art thou safe but if not surely they shall do thee no hurt for i think indeed that thou art some great one and he fell to striding down the hall toward the door but she ran after him and caught his arm and said nay nay i will not hide to be dragged out of my refuge like a thief thou sayest well that i am of the great i will stand by thee and command and forbid as a queen oh go not to the door stay by me stay 
nay nay he said there is naught for it but the deed of arms look seest thou not steel by the porch and therewith he broke from her and ran to the door and was met upon the very threshold by all armed men upon whom he fell without more ado crying out for the tofts for the tofts the woodman to the rescue and he hewed right and left on whatsoever was before him so that what fell not gave back and for a moment of time he cleared the porch but in that nick of time his axe brake on the bassnet of a huge man-at-arms and they all thrust on him together and drave him back into the hall and came bundling after him in a heap but he drave his shield at one and then with his right hand smote another on the bare face so that he rolled over and stirred no more till the day of doom then was there a weapon before him might he have stooped to pick it up but he might not so he caught hold of a sturdy but somewhat short man by the collar and the lap of his leather surcoat and drew her back and with a mighty heave cast him on the rout of them who for their parts had drawn back a little also as if he had been a huge stone and down went two before that artillery and they set up a great roar of wonder and fear but he followed them and this time got an axe in his hand so mazed they were by his onset and he hewed at them again and drave them aback to the threshold of the door but could get them no further and they began to handle long spears to thrust at him but then came forward a knight no mickle man but clad in very goodly armour with a lion beaten in gold on his grey surcoat this man smote up the spears and made the men go back a little while he stood on the threshold so christopher saw that he would parley with him and forbore him and the knight spake thou youngling art thou mad what doest thou falling on my folk and what do ye said christopher fiercely besetting the houses of folk with weapons now wilt thou take my life but i shall yet slay one or two before i die get thee back lord or thou shalt be the first but the knight who had no weapon in his hand said we come but to seek our own and that is the lady of Meadham who dwelleth at green harbour by her own will and if thou wilt stand aside thou mayst go free to the devil for us now would christopher have shouted and fallen on and gone to his death there and then but even therewith a voice clear and sweet spake at the back of him and said thou kind host do thou stand aside and let us speak that which is needful and therewith stepped forth goldilind and stood beside christopher and said sir Burgreave, we rode forth to drink the air yesterday and went astray amidst the wild wood and were belated so that we must needs lie down under the bare heaven but this morning we happened upon this kind forester who gave us to eat and took us to his house and gave us meat and drink for which it was seemlier to reward him than threaten him now it is our pleasure that ye lead us back to green harbour but as for this youth that ye do him no hurt but let him go free according to thy word spoken e'en now sir Burgreave. she spake slowly and heavily as one who hath a lesson to say and it was to be seen of her that all grief was in her heart though her words were queenly some of them that heard laughed but the Burgreave spake and said lady we will do thy will in part for we will lead thee to green harbour in all honour but as to this young man if he will not be slain here and now needs must he with us for he hath slain two of our men outright and hath hurt many and methinks the devil of the woods is in his body so do thou bid him be quiet if thou wouldst not see his blood flow she turned a pale unhappy face on christopher and said my friend we bid thee withstand them no more but let them do with thee as they will christopher stood aside therewith and sat down on a bench and laughed and said in a high voice stout men at arms forsooth to take a maid's kirtle to their shield but therewith the armed men poured into the hall and a half dozen of the stoutest came up unto christopher where he sat and bound his hands with their girdles and he withstood them no whit but sat laughing in their faces and made as if it were all a yuletide game but inwardly his heart burned with anger and with love of that sweet lady then they made him stand up and led him without the house and set him on a horse 
and linked his feet together under the belly thereof and when that was done he saw them lead out the lady and they set her in a horse litter and then the whole troop rode off together with two men riding on either side of the said litter in this wise they left littledale End of part four.